All right, so uh, thank you everybody. I hope you are still holding up. How are you after those two days? All good? Great. All right, ah, that's the spirit. I love that. <laughs> All right, so I, I'm extremely thankful to be here. I'm ex extremely excited. Uh, I only been able to attend today, but it's energizing. It's good. It's great to see the community. It's good to see you people. You are the, the, the doers. And well, obviously, in my position now, we're presenting a government. Uh, sure, we're doing stuff, right? We're doing some stuff. Uh, we're doing regulation mostly, but it's definitely not at the same level. So I just wanted to start with a little change of scene and to give you how we think as a government. Then I'll move into UTM. That, that's my main job. So I joined FOCA to be working on, on drone integration, safe, secure, efficient, and what it means. So we'll spend a little bit of time on that. And then I have a big question. Then I have something that I want us to think about together, is how can we change the way we think about making things fly? Aviation has been doing a lot of great work for many, many years, but still, we need to change, we need to improve, we, we need to be faster, and I need your help. I don't have the answers, so I'm really here you know, with a, a big question mark. So, I know when we think about government, and in particular when we think about civil aviation authorities, we, we tend to think safety, safety, safety. Oh, you can't do that. You know, it's not safe. It's not secure. We spend a lot of time thinking about safety and security. That is true. We also spend a lot of time thinking about how can we make you all participate to this new, to this new era of aviation in you know, a fair way. And it's not easy. And, and the reason I put this slide here is because we don't always understand the, the consequences of what we do. You know, sometimes you have good intentions and they end up being, well, the end result is not what you wanted. When you're a government, this can have very, very bad consequences. So we spend a lot of time thinking, if we go that way, Will everybody be able to participate? Who is excluded? What's the impact? So when you talk to us, keep that in mind. We're not only obsessed about safety and security, we're also very careful to make sure that we're not excluding anyone. So there are other ways of looking at it. So market power is to say, well, you know, I'm going here, and this is my idea, and then, you know, it's uh, patented to death, and nobody can uh, come, and obviously then you have your monopoly, this is a big no-go, we don't want to hear that, we're very um, adverse to that. Externalities is stuff like, um, well, actually, I spend a lot of time developing something, but then there's no way I can protect it, and everybody is going to steal it, you, you mentioned it before, we're also very pretty sensitive to that. Stuff like information asymmetry, this is when suddenly you have part of the market that is very well informed. Like, let's say, as government, I decide I only talk to you and nobody else. And so you know everything, everybody else doesn't. This is not good. So we're also really trying to make sure everybody has the same understanding of the situation so you have any, you know, fair chances to access, to, to access the market. And capability failure is perhaps the worst, is when... Individual companies, individual group of people don't have the necessary knowledge to achieve a goal, but when you put them all together, they suddenly have that capacity. And, and so as a government, what you want to do is bring everybody together, so suddenly you get to that level where things that you want can happen. And I, I don't know if you get that feeling, but when I look at this list, it's pretty much open source, right? It's pretty much what you are doing. You are making sure that everybody has a fair access, you are making sure that everybody has a fair understanding, you are making sure that everybody can act upon things. So that's why I'm really thinking we, there's something we have to do together. There's a new way of doing things, because the way we do things at this stage is to work on standards, for instance. So this is something I know is referred, you refer to uh, at least um, in the PX4 community. Um, this is an industry standard. And for us, an industry standard is perfect. We don't have to do anything. It is among you. You, you, know, you do your stuff. You agree. It's be beautiful. No problem. Um, and it's usually pretty powerful. You then have things like that. Who among you is using this kind of document? Anyone? How much do you love it? 
zero to 10, you can stop at, uh, you know, you can even put between zero and one. These are called acceptable means of compliance. It's, those are not standards per se, it's, you know, quality, assurance level and stuff like that. Extremely powerful, extremely useful, extremely painful, but, you know, these are why we're all so happy to uh, go in a, in a plane. So it's, it's pretty good, but it's pretty tough. And then you have the regulatory standards. Do you know these signs? Everybody is familiar with those? EC marking. So pretty much all the drones that you'll have in the European market will have to get one of those. It will tell you exactly you know, how many volts you can have in your batteries. It will tell you exactly what you do, how you do stuff. It tells you exactly which precise tender you must use in order to access the European market. The good thing is that it is self-declared, so you, nobody is going to come knock on the door and say, prove me that you have used this NSI CTA standard. But if we catch you not doing it, then it's tough. Then you don't have access to the European market anymore. And you know, that's what happens. It's, <laughs> it's, it's bad. Regulating standards as a last thing, right? It's really very detailed, very tough, um, but in the same time, easy, right? For you, it's much better than that. You know the standard, you go there, it's two pages, it costs 70, it costs 70 bucks for two pages, it doesn't matter. Once you have it, um, it's, it's fine. You know, I put the little snail here because that's the issue. This is a string. I don't know how many characters it has. Maybe 10, maybe 12, right? It takes two years to develop. So realize that we need two years, uh, industry and governments, to agree on uh, a string of 12 characters. Imagine when we get into other uh, developments. It's, it's much worse. So this is one thing. So this is to, to give you a little bit about how we think about the world and what we do and, and what kind of tools we want to have. Now, my job actually is pretty specific at the moment. So we don't see innovation only as UTM, but UTM is a big part of it at the moment, is integrating drones in the airspace. Um, and the reason I say UTM does not exist, I'll, I'll give you a, a definition later, but it's here yet, it's because Actually, we're not talking about a service that we're going to switch on one day and switch off if we're happy. UTM, the way we look at it, is exactly like the internet, right? It's a, it's a series of protocols. It's a serial layer of hardware and software that you, you put together. And at the end of the day, it's a distributed system. You don't really have any control over it. Uh, and this is, this is good, and this is the way we want it. So when we think about integrating drones in the civil airspace, we are not aiming at having that massive ATM-like, so ATM is an air traffic management-like system where we have a few people in a room who are going to tell you, you fly here and you don't fly here, you stop, you go there. This is not going to happen. This is not our vision at all. We're talking about distributed systems that you will have access to and you will be able to uh, develop individually. This is our current CONOPS, Concept of Operation, and you will see here a lot of uh, familiar names. Um, you know, we, we talk, you, you talked yesterday about the, the ground control stations, a lot about the different things. Um, <clears throat> at this stage, we have three things in Europe that are kind of ready, standardized, and ready to be pushed up to 2020. One is registration. So soon, all drone users will have to get registered unless you uh, fly a toy. A toy is defined pretty much as any drone below 250 grams. Uh, once you're above that, you will get registered. Um, remote identification is also coming. Um, and in that sense, expect to see two lines, uh, broadcast um, identification. You just say, hey, who am I uh, to the world, whoever listens. Uh, we're also thinking about network identification, where you, you provide a, a full picture through your um, service providers. Um, and the last thing is geofencing. So those are the very basic, simple building blocks that we kind of have already. It's not a big, it's not a big issue. We are now looking into the next uh, chapter, the next evolution. And this is pretty much what we have in the middle. So USP stands for um, UAS Service Provider. 
any company providing service that gives you access to the airspace. Um, and here you have a lot of stuff. So actually, not all of that is going to be mandatory. You know, it's, it's just a, a list of services that you could have. Um, and again, you find that, you know, the weather, uh, flight planning, uh, logbooks. I mean, you, you're probably familiar with a lot of that. On the, on the left side, you have something called the themes. This is all, you can think of it, and I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit, but think of it as your connection to manned aviation. So here you get uh, aeronautical data, uh, you get information about where the airports are and, and what happens if you want to fly there, how do you ask people, a few rules and, and stuff like that. And below you have the authority USB, and this is more, you know, what happens when the military want to uh, access the system? What happens when the police wants to do something? And so we need a way for the authorities to be linked to that so they can say, you know, oh, we are uh, here, the, the police, we need to do an intervention somewhere, and please leave us uh, fly there, uh, and this is, will be done independently. So, as you can see, it is a, it is a pretty um, dense ecosystem, and that's why we want it to be distributed, because this is the only way you make it happen. You, you can't decide that this has to happen tomorrow on any given date. But the, the big thing here um, is strategic deconfiction. And if we quickly go back here, this inter-USP bubble at the bottom, that's strategic deconfiction. So strategic deconfiction is your flight planning. Where am I going to be tomorrow between 2 and 3? And this is where I want to fly. So you're telling the world your intention. So it's a good thing. Um, but you need to understand that it's not centralized. So how do you broadcast it, and who do you broadcast this to if it's not centralized? Well, as you well know, there are many ways to create distributed systems. Um, the way we are looking at it at the moment, and that's why we're getting into open source, is to use this inter-USS platform. And actually, each US service provider would have to run an instance of the inter-USS uh, inter platform that would allow them to then communicate with the others, share flight planning, and have a situational awareness. Where is everybody? The beauty of it is that we want to make sure that data privacy is, is there. So how we achieve that? You will only get access to other people's information if you are active in an area. So we're using a, a gridded system, and you say, okay, I am here in that grid, and I'm flying today. Who else is there? And only people who are also on that grid will share information with you. And so you don't have everybody knowing about, knowing about everybody else. And this is kind of the key principles. How do we protect privacy while maximizing the information sharing? Um, and if you want to abuse the system, well, it's pretty simple. We remove you to the list of people who can run an inter USS platform, and so you don't have access to all others, and basically you're out of the system. So we have a pretty good incentive to make sure everybody is honest and is not spamming and is not uh, spying, right? So this is the kind of options that we're exploring, um, and it's pretty new. I mean, there's no... Maybe in other areas this has been done, but in my experience in aviation, having something like that decentralized based on open source, is really, really new. Um, basically, what, what it does is, is a simple mechanism. What I just said is discovery, who else is there, who else shall I talk to, and synchronization, making sure all data are, are synchronized. And the beauty of it is that you can use it for other services, right? Here we, we said, oh, let's share uh, flight plans. But then you can say, oh, let's uh, share remote ideas. Who um, from my participants are where? And then suddenly you also do the same, discovery, synchronization, and you can keep going like that, and it's, uh, it's really interesting. So what we do, again, as authority is just that, uh, saying you can participate, you cannot participate because you don't meet certain requirements, and then if you meet them, the goal, the idea would be that you can participate. So the, the idea would be to get as close as possible to making sure you meet technical requirements. 
Because nowadays, if you want to become an air navigation service provider, you know, it's, it's uh, pretty tough. Uh, there are people coming on site, uh, inspecting your, uh, where you work, how you work, how you train, at what time in the morning you, you're coming there. I mean, you know, I think this is great for avi traditional aviation, but we need to, to change that mindset if we want to move into the world of drones. Um, and that's where I need you. That's where... I need to understand how are we moving, how are we working together to get there. So industry standards, again, easy. M acceptable means of compliance. I think we'll find ways. We'll always find ways of making it working. We, we, we understand that. But is there a way? How do we integrate into regulation something like inter-USS? I'm not sure we, we know exactly how to do it. And I don't think that any decisions like that you know, should be taken without having you in the loop, you know, developers, making sure that we really go with the people developing, making sure that we're very close from action, actually. And that's why I'm here today. So that, that's the idea. And there could be other ways. There could be other areas that are up for open source and where we could point to. Uh, and I think Lawrence this morning had a pretty good, you know, um, sentence about... We want to make sure that whatever we do, it's not at the competition level. So please compete. That is our goal. Our goal is to provide a framework where you compete. But our goal is also to make sure that wherever there's no competition, because it doesn't make sense to compete, then we provide a framework that is open, that is flexible, and so forth. And here again, that's why I need your help. So if you, if you have ideas, if you see things, if you heard about how this has been done in other industries, you know, please contact me, come back to me. I think we have shared the information in the, in, the, in the schedule, and I'll be very interested to hear from you. That's it. <laughs>